All wow. right, Donnie, thank you. And, um, you know, we've been here in the sanctuary for about five minutes. Yeah, about five minutes. It minutes. is a little bit dreary out there. I, I guess we shouldn't say dreary. It's pretty lousy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's call it what it is. It is ugly. I mean, 30, what do you say, 34 degrees? About 33, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And rain, oh, brother, so, but, <laughs> so, but this will make us appreciate. This is our worship here. This is the sanctuary of Christ, God, right? That's right. That's right. So um, we're here in the sanctuary. There's uh, eight, nine of us, ten of us. And I know, I'm sure there's people joining us online. For those online, we really, we get started, then we really, our conversation largely happens in here. Yep. And, and, you know, I know it's live stream, so it's unfortunately a one-way conversation. Um, I know there's a Sabbath school class downstairs too. Actually, Josephine's is Zoom, and, and Ralph. Ralph has one, yep, yeah. Ralph yeah. Gifford's yep. got one. So that's yep. more dialogue. So I think it should be on the church website if you're, you know, wanting that more. Um, so, but anyway, it's good to be here. So I think we should pray. And uh, would you pray for us, Doug? Sure. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for bringing us through a new, uh, another week for your safety, your guidance, and your protection. I ask you that you be with the pastor and I as we discuss worship, uh, proper worship with you, Lord. Please help us to be uh, enlightened and to uh, have a better understanding of what worship is. I pray these things, and not in our own name, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, you know, when I first saw this lesson title yep and i saw the title is worship that never ends now i'm gonna be totally honest with you if i was a five-year-old kid 10 year old <laughs> 15 year old i don't think that there could have been a worse title <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know that and i mean let's be candid with each other i mean when you're a kid right when you're a kid you know, that hour, it can be the longest of the week. Yep. And, and I think that's, that's a problem across all denominations, you know. And, and, of course, the Catholic faith before Vatican II, they were doing everything in Latin. Yep. And then yep. so half the people there, what well, I'm saying, half the people, probably 99% of the people didn't understand what the priest was doing anyway. But there was something mysterious going on, and they just believed in that. But... Um, so it's kind of a, it's, it, you know, it depends on your perspective. Right. And what is worship? It's how it's framed. Exactly. Essentially how you look at how you've been framed to think of worship Yeah. is how you think of it. Right. As a kid, when you hear it never ends, you think, my goodness, I got to be on my knees 24 hours a day. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a and little, you know. Do I have to listen to that preacher <laughs> drone on for yeah. how many days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yep. But it's it's interesting, I think, and this is where it gets more personal. So years ago, I came across a really pivotal article uh, to me by a guy named Jack Hayford, and it was he it was published in 1999, and the title is really grappling to me: How God Evaluates Worship. Amen. Yeah. I mean, that's really what matters, <clears throat> and and it's a powerful article. Um, and I'm just going to, he had four bullet points here. And I think this is where, to be candid, you know, we can miss out on this because we just are used to going through the motions. So point number one, true worship treasures God's presence. True worship present, uh, treasures, what is going on? We have operational difficulties here. I'm going to go this way. And then it's probably all going to go off. Yep. I wonder if somebody else is using the app. Okay. There you go. We're back on. We're now. back on. But yep. Yep. there's probably too many people with that <laughs> app. <laughs> so true worship. Now think about that sentence. True. Did it go out again? No. No. Okay. Good, no. True yep. worship treasures God's yes. presence. That's a really pregnant sentence right there. You know, what good does it do? to have the best music, yeah. homiletician, uh, orator, 
but not have God's presence. It means nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not, mean not nothing. with God's presence here. Not without God's presence. You got no meaning in, <laughs> no exactly. meaning at no all. No meaning really. and and yeah. there's no no real communion there. Wow, we just started a disco tech here. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday night, Saturday night so, fever. Somebody's we... trying to interrupt our worship. Yeah, that's this right. Morning. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but treasuring God's presence—that's a powerful, um, you know, uh, concept. Yep. Yep. And and when you look at the Old Testament imagery with the sanctuary and how how uh, supernatural it was when God showed up in the temple and and when you know when he consumed the yeah, offering the fire the fire yeah, yep and 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 to have to treasure God's presence and i think that that can get that really can get lost you know what what's what you're bringing out is people ended up getting lost in that ritualistic right Right. Uh, rules and regulations, and we're we're no longer. We're going to talk about that later. I think the lesson talks about yep. false, uh, false false worship. sacrifice. Yep. yep. Where the people ended up becoming heartless in terms of how they did it. It was yeah. no longer in the heart, and God despised the the sacrifice. But you're right. It's a. It's, well, it's, uh, it's how to be in God's presence. Is, yep. uh, yeah. Well, yep. I t give the credit to Jack Hayford, who actually he's not a Seventh Day Adventist, but. Uh, in one of our songbooks, uh, he wrote one of our song, one of the songs in our mm -hmm. one of our songbooks. So, but secondly, true worship humbles the heart. Yep. yep. True worship humbles the heart, and I think that's, uh, you know, whether you're, you know, on the platform or, you know, in the farthest back pew of the balcony, it changes us. And I have often believed that if we leave the worship service the same way we came in something is wrong yeah something hasn't changed we we yep. need to change it must be a transformative moment i'm not saying we're going to walk in and while wow, we're going to walk out we'll be we won't have any sin problems and we're just going to be an angel on the face of this this earth that's it, not what i'm saying but it's we're going to have an insight or revelation yeah. it 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 um humbling the heart sees our true condition yeah, the Lord ex gets exactly. us to see who we truly are yep. and our need of him. Yep. Uh, without him, we're nothing. And yep. so this is what it means. I think humbling of heart sees, hey, I'm truly not sometimes what I think I am. That's exactly <laughs> You know what right. I mean? Yep. It, it's, we have this perception that everything's okay and it's yep. not really okay. Yep. You know? But God gets it. And it, it's beautiful because <clears throat> then God says, my love is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Yep. And you have now a security. Yeah. Yeah. In knowing that he's going to be on your side, he's going to help you out through that whole process. Exactly. That very good point. Very, very, very good. And then here's another one that's kind of different. But true worship sacrifices and yeah. then expects something from God. Now, that may seem a little presumptuous, but I see where he's going like yeah. this. It's not expectation like you owe me, God, but like you maybe should have said anticipating. You know, whether it be sacrificing our time, our offering, whatever it may be, even our hearts, you know, we, we say God's going to respond in some way. And, and it, you know, <coughs> how that's going to be, it's up to God. Right. So, right. and then fourthly, true worship extends God's love. So it takes the, the love that we've experienced and, and, and that we've seen and it, and it mm -hmm. takes it throughout the world. And, and remember, worship doesn't necessarily happen only at 337 Main Street, South Lancaster, at 1115. Worship happens when you're opening up your Bible at 6 a.m., you know, and reading the Bible or a devotional book. Worship happens when you're driving down the car or down the road and you're, you know, enjoying a, a yeah. beautiful song. You know, that's worship, and it it's, can happen any place. Worship at work. Yep, yep. And it's through everything throughout the day. Everything you do is, is a type of worship for the Lord. Really. Exactly. So your your lively your life and yeah, your demonstration right. exactly. of what you show is a demonstration of your worship for for God. Yep. So so worship that never ends. So what is worship? What is worship? 
I came up with a few things of my own that I thought of, and that's it extends, and I think to, I'm not sure if it's Sunday's lesson or Monday's lesson. I, I um, no, the new song, I'm talking about the, oh, okay. um, where your own personal experience is really shows your demonstration of what God has done for you, and then in turn creates that worship for what he has done for you in your life. I think the greatest strength of showing who God is is your own personal experiences. I couldn't, I couldn't say it better myself. And testimony is the most powerful thing. Yep. And it reaches people, aside from just scroll, quoting scripture for people. Yep. It's your own life and what God has, shown, what is, God has done for you in your personal life. Yep. It really reaches out to people more than, than anything. It does. And, and you know, again, we're, part of the picture we're trying to wrestle with here is what, what is the nature of God? Yeah. yeah. I mean, is God happy and content <clears throat> sitting on a throne eons away and, and he hears the angels singing glory, 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 and he's looking at the universe that he's ruling over? Yeah. Is that what God is looking for? What do you think? Is that it? Ralph, and by the way, Ralph, you speak, then, but no, nobody else is raising their hand yet. When you first um, started, you said, you know, what do you think of worship? And as a kid, I used to dread prayer. Oh, wow. Because you're kneeling around with your family, your knees are getting tired, and, you know, there's always that one guy who just can't shut up. <laughs> has to have the <laughs> longest prayer on the record of earth. And as a kid, I just dreaded that. Yeah. So for me, worship, I guess, is, you know, linked to prayer, and it didn't have a good connotation as a kid. And I think I wish I would have learned more about praising God and enjoying God than I did. It, it's almost like, I, I kind of feel what you're feeling like, why is prayer, for a lot of people, a struggle? Mm. Is it because the way that we have grown up to think how, again, like I said a while ago, how, how worship is framed, mm -hmm. how we perceive worship to be, we, it's almost like it's rehearsed. Mm -hmm. We do it because we have to. Mm. It's not something that comes from the heart. Right. Um, and oftentimes that's what happens. We end up rehearsing our prayers a lot of times. We're yeah. not, we're not yeah. sincere. And God, all he wants is relationship. It's relationship with him that he's yeah. looking for. And I think he thrives with you having an interest in him yeah. as a creator. But ultimately, we are all here because of him. Well, we yeah. are breathing because of him. Yep. So, so he looks for that recognition. I mean, he does. he's the ultimate creator of everyone, everything in, in here. So we, he deserves that worship. But the question is, how is it framed in our own minds that we can't? So I want to push Ralph a little further here. Yep. So Ralph, so I can relate to your experience because growing up yep. in the Pro River SDA Church, I still remember 210 North Middletown Road. <laughs> <laughs> still remember that. Uh, there was a dear elder, and his name he's passed, but he was a dear. He was a he was a good man, Roger Bird. But I'm telling you, I, I have to be honest with you. I, his prayer was every week was the same. And I could almost had it memorized, you know. And, and I'm like, okay. So he says this. Hey, he said that last week. He said the week before. And, and, and it's like, okay, so what's going on here? So, you know, I, I think, you know, Ralph, you remember a really good point. And maybe we need to really be much, much, much more intentional about worship in the sense yeah. that it's, you know, it's a blank sheet of paper. And, and what, do we, what do we design out of that? What's, what's, what does that look like? And, and we have a good system, you know, and that's a good, you know, the invocation, yeah. you know, the, with the postlude, and, and, and it has a nice flow to it. But um, what is worship, you know, and what is God looking for? What, what really, you know, <sighs> clicks? It needs to be more personal, I think. You know, heartfelt, like that person who said the same prayer every week, every week, every week. You know, the first time, I'm sure it was heartfelt, but after a while, he just got in a habit. 
I know. There's a German prayer for, you know, when we sit down and have grace, it's alle guten Gaben, dank sei dir dafür. You know, it's basically just this little thing you recite, but it doesn't really, it's just a recital. Right. It's, it's not like, Lord, thank you so much today for challenging me with snow or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> Whatever the beautiful it, weather we're having next week, it, it's not. Yeah. Is it possible? If, if that you and I had a relationship, and all I ever did was recite the same thing to you, yeah. you know, you'd be like, "This is not someone who loves me or cares about me. They're just saying their thing." Yeah. I think God is the same. He wants to hear from us, what's yeah. going on with us, and how we feel. And I think he he wants us to be genuine with him. Yes. Yeah. Um, but w that raises a good question. Why is it? That we think that way. Why is it that there's a, but, a distance, but, a, a, a non-connection going on? But you on? see, you touch another word there, genuine. Yeah. I mean, we need to acknowledge that we can be present in body, but not in spirit. E exactly. You know, we can be, I mean, I've, been, I've done it. You know, you're sitting in the pew, and man, your mind is a... And I remember in the church, you know, I always would daydream. I daydreamed a lot during sermons. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. You know, and you're just looking out the window, and oh, it's a nice day, and there's this cool rock that'd be cool to climb on, you know, and, and, and so your mind is going elsewhere. So, I mean, we, of course, the problem is we're dealing now with multi-generations, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and um, yeah, but, but to be fully present is important. What it, there's an expression. Do not worship false gods and do not worship God falsely. Yep. Yep. And I think that's true because do not worship, you know, right there, don't have no other false gods before you. You know, but do not worship God falsely. In other words, hey, wait a second. Let's be honest. I can read the, you know, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. We can sing it, you know, like we, but Wait a second. Let's think about these words. <laughs> well, Amazing and, and grace, also, how sweet the sound. You know, just to yeah. think, and it takes time, and it's, mm -hmm. it's harder for us to do that in a corporate setting because we're so used to individualism. But it challenges us to say, okay, you know, let's yeah. harmonize here and let's pull our voices together. And there's a commandment that says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all exactly. your soul, and all your mind. So yep. that tells you what he's looking for. Right? Yep. He's not looking uh, for ritual, uh, re, uh, re, um, how do you say that, memorized prayers yep. and stuff like that. He's looking for relationship. Yep. It, but I think in a lot of cases we have a tendency to disconnect because we see him as such a great being. Yep. And how could such a great being connect with us Exactly. on, just... on, the, on, a, on the same level that yep. human beings do? Yep. It, 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 I think there's, there's a disconnect somewhere, and I, I can't really link all the reasons why we feel that way, but it's just we can't seem to... Another thing, he's not necessarily physically present. Right. So you, we are all used to relationship from a physical point of view where we see each other, yep. we physically, hey, you pat yep. each other yep. on the back. Yep. And, but with God, that's not, it's not an option right now. Yeah. Okay? But he is... Can I... Let me yep. stretch this a little further. Yep. All right. If we go off the... Way, off the <laughs> into heresy, you let us know. But God is more than physically present. He yes. is present in you. He's present in Myron. He's present in yeah. Marge. And, and Jesus said something really profound that we often overlook, where two or three are gathered in my name. Yeah. There I am in the midst of them. Now, that, that statement isn't to make yeah. us feel better when we have two or three people at a meeting when you want to have 50. It's saying something happens <clears throat> when, yeah. when, when, when we see each other and we talk about Jesus Christ, when we sing. So, well, that, that brings us right into... Su um, let's, yeah, let's get uh, to the Sunday, lesson here, uh, guys. Well, Sunday said, lift out your hands in the sanctuary, which is kind of what we've rolled around with already. Uh, in a sense, but a Sunday's lesson, a Monday's lesson, where it says, "Sing to the Lord a new song, a new song." Yep. Not old, new. And this is where I brought up our personal experiences with Christ, where we have unique 
experiences that God has been with us throughout that process that is not the same as any other any other person. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's that's that new song, that, new, that song. new praise, that yeah. new where we glorify the Lord for yeah. what He's done for us individually. So it's interesting you said that because I listened to a podcast and, and I'd heard this years ago, but I kind of forgotten it that when Christ is on the cross he is actually singing the Psalms. You know, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, this is really what he's going through. We only record part of that. You know, why have thou forsaken me? That part. Why do we think, first of all, we, we have got a lot of layers to deal with. Yeah. First of all, singing doesn't have to be only happy stuff. <laughs> you know, you can sing. You can wail. You can, you can just mourn, grieve. Yep. Yep. And and uh, a couple of months ago, I did a funeral service for a family that uh, from from another culture, and and I was kind of taken back by the display of just sheer emotion, and and it just you know took me just took a a, a second to kind of say okay, yeah. so this is what what people do in other cultures, so. But then the other thing is, we're so obsessed with perfection that we're thinking, well, I can't sing. You know, I can't sing. <laughs> and so, you know, but no, I mean, that's not the point. Yeah. And, and we always say, don't make a joyful noise to the Lord. You know, I would say from God's perspective, some, sometimes when we're worshiping the Lord in voice only, that's more noisy than if we were to, to God, than if we were to sing off key in, with our hearts. Do you see what I'm saying? Am I, you, you, know, you raised something to me that just hit me right now. Um, is it possible that when we, we say our things to the Lord, right, mm -hmm. that we're not, li we're not allowing for response? Oh, that's, I mean, that's a good point. We, we say it, and we don't wait for God's response to us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to bring out a personal experience. Just yeah. something recently that happened to me. And it's the littlest of things that allows for you to be thankful and be, have gratitude and honest for what the Lord does for you. I recently was having an issue in the classroom with one student, just one. And it was troubling me. It's funny how it is, right? You got 22 students, a majority are good with what you do, but you always got that one, and that <laughs> one is what yep. derails you. Yeah, of course, of course. So it's creating a certain amount of stress. Yeah, as now was he, just so you know, he teaches that uh, college. Sigmund, yeah, Sigmund college community level. college. So yeah, not, like, college yeah. not like third so, graders. So <laughs> um, I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I said, I need your help. I need your assistance, because I certainly can approach it in my way and view of how I think should, things should be. And I just made that simple prayer. I walked into the classroom. It's almost like the words were coming out instantly. I didn't even have to force nothing. It just was all, never heard a response from the student that didn't give me any trouble, any problem. I said, Lord, put the words in my mouth. Yeah. As I got out of that classroom, a spirit of thankfulness and gratitude came upon me, a type of worship. Yeah. Because all of us have those daily. All of us do. And sometimes we keep it to ourselves. But it comes into the, one of the lesson study, uh, part of the lesson that says, if this is there, we have to portray that to the world. Yeah. That's part of worship. It is part and that's one simple experience, but there are many others yeah. that all of us could tell others, but we restrain. We just keep it to ourselves and yeah. figure nobody's going to be interested in what we have to say. But that's not true. The Lord does that for what reason? Because he wants that reverence. He wants that respect. He wants that thankfulness. He wants that gratitude. Yeah. Because he does things for us that we don't merit. Yeah. What, great, what was causing me to think that way was what caused the reaction to the student to think that way? Yeah. It oh, must the... have been something I must have said or have done that caused God, that reaction. No, I... You see? Yeah. But that's an experience. With the exception of you and me, people are funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> well, but any type of position of leadership, you're oh, going to face that kind of thing. We're all, right? we're all, we all got our quirks. So. And it may sound like a simple experience that to you guys wouldn't even have any reverence, but to me it was. Yeah. Because the Lord put yeah. the words in my mouth. Yeah. I didn't ask for anything. It just yeah. happened because I asked. Yeah. That's good. Right? That's good. And many other things that we can all t have yep. testimony about. But yep. this is a type of worship. Yep. It's a, showing the Lord the proper respect and honest and, and gratitude and mm -hmm. everything that he deserves to have. Yeah. We don't, we're not deserving of anything, really. No. Except that he gave his son as a sacrifice, which is the ultimate sacrifice. Yep. But anyway. Let's switch gears. Did we, uh, we, I'm putting, thinking at Psalm 22. So we're talking 22. about new songs, right? So well, You're looking at uh, Monday's, Monday's lesson. lesson yeah. Okay. Sunday we kind of touched on yep. at the beginning when, with your article. So, there, it kind of fit that perfectly. Um, so Psalm 131. Let's take a look at that. And yep. turn your Bibles. And let's see what we can discover here. So... <clears throat> Psalm 31, 131, my heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. Mm. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Yep. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. It's called an assault, a song of ascents of David. Yeah. Now, the question is, what does this teach us here about our relationship with God? My heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Mm. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. I feel like Myron wants to say something. No? Okay, you're good? All right. So what do you see here? What's, what's David's frame of mind? What's his attitude? You notice it. Everybody's so quiet. I know. Nobody <laughs> wants to talk here this morning. Ralph, soon you have to start going around putting your, putting the mic in front of random people's faces. You know, yeah. what do you think? No, we would never do that. Humility, right? Humility. Yeah. What in the world is humility? Humility is the opposite of being proud. Yeah, but what's proud? <laughs> <laughs> so, what is humility? I know, I we know. We hear it all the time. We, yeah. Yeah, but we, we have a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at Marge. No. Marge has nothing so, to do. <laughs> that's the only problem with the live stream. And I, and I, and I know if we were in a circle, yeah. you know, without the lights, everybody would be more talkative. But it's sort of intimidating with the lights. So I understand that. But humility, what is, let's take a guess, a stab at it here. De a working definition. Well, generally, isn't it associated with someone that's successful, but... Say it one more time. Generally, in my mind, when I think of humility, I think of someone who's very successful, but doesn't act like it. Uh -huh. Or someone who's good at a sport, but doesn't, you know, like, hey, look at me. Yeah. But I think in our case, humility would be, yeah, I've done things as a human, but it, the praise goes back to God, not to me. Like, I had, I had really nothing to do with it. Except my body, but. Can, and I'm going to springboard off of that. I think, I like that. Can we say it means knowing our, our ordained place in life? Playing the position. Whether it be, you know, a cotter pin on a gigantic engine or... You know, the crankshaft, you know, which would be very, you know, we would say, oh, well, the crankshaft is more important, but you take the cotter pin away and, and the whole thing can fall apart. <clears throat> yeah, it's like you know, the human body without its human, parts, right? Exactly. It's kind of the same thing. Exactly. Um, 
When we call attention on ourselves, we have to ask ourselves the question, why are we looking for that? Why are we wanting attentions from human beings to, it's almost like we want that to certify that we're doing good. Right. That if we don't get that, we kind of feel like it's a failure. Mm. But where is that supposed to come from in the first place? Are we looking at it for, from people around us or from the Lord? <laughs> Because ultimately, that's what it is. If I'm trying to continually draw attention to myself right. for what I do, I right. have to ask myself, what's my motivation? Right. So that's a good question. So what, what do you guys think? Is it okay for us to say, hey, I need a little validation here? Or are we, you know, what does it look, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be a human being? I think that's where, and I hope you're, I hope you're following my train of thought here because ultimately we are creating the image of God. <clears throat> so what does that mean? And, and I think there's, it's, it's, there's a little bit of ebb and flow on this. Is that we receive and we give. We receive, we give. I don't, I'm and not I, sure the, 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 but that it's, it's wrong to have an expectation. Right of being recognized, right. but it has to come from the other individual and not me forcing right. it right. upon others to try to tell me right. that I'm good. Right. I think it has to come from God utilizing others to say, hey, or even, even himself to say, hey, everything you have is because of me. Right. Your successes right. are related to me. <clears throat> right. It's not of your own doing. Right. That even if I gave you talent, you got to recognize that those talents were given by me. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yep. And I think humility comes from the fact that I have nothing without God. Right. I have nothing at, at all. But oftentimes human beings like to praise each other. Hey, good work, man. Yep. You, you're the one. You're, yeah. you're the one that achieved everything. But, but that's <laughs> where I think it gets to be overdone. Yes. I think, you know, I think there's something to be said about saying, <clears throat> I'm going to pick on Marge. I'd like to pick on Marge, <laughs> you know. Marge, it was so good to see your smile this Sabbath. You know, just something like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and to see, you know, there's something about w when we come together, we, we're embracing Paul's theology about we are the body of Christ. And every single one of us has a role to play. And that's part yep. of the picture, the yep. interdynamics, the interplay, the uh, interconnectedness of, a, of each other. Yeah. And that's something we, we need to, you know, the, el the hand needs the elbow. There's no other way to put it. Well, this is all this term. Well, we can't tell them too much. We don't want them gloating over themselves. You hear well, that a lot in, in some of the cultures yeah, around. Yeah, I know. No, we've got to refrain from doing it because we don't yeah. want them to have a haughty head. Right, right. But that, are we doing that for that reason? Because, again, that creates another motivation. We've got a wrong motivation of saying, okay, we can't tell the pastor, for example, that he's doing a good job mm. because that would make him feel. Yeah. But we're not supposed to think that way. We're supposed to no. compliment each other and we support each, each other, other. And, and keep each other up and say, hey, man, you're doing a great work. It builds a person. Yeah, it, and I think the know? problem is, you know, we got to remember, my friends, that when we, in this world, yeah, negative, negative, you know, and uh, so coming back here, so it, yes, we can say, thank God I'm able to, uh, you know, I mean, look at, you know, it's like Tom Brady showing up. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a good quarterback, you know. I mean, that's, you know, we know he's, that's just a lie. <laughs> we know he knows he's a good quarterback. We know he knows. So, you know, you have to be modest about it. And so... You know, you can still be a great quarterback. I never met the man, but you could be a great quarterback, but still say, hey, look, oh, yep. you know, uh, we need to set up tables for Pollock. Yeah, come over and help, you know, and, and just be totally down to earth. One thing about that, that song, if you look at the other half of it, he's completely content. Exactly. Being weaned like a child. So what does a child, what's a child do? They're completely dependent on the parent. Exactly. For subsistence. Exactly. So what is he really saying? He said, I'm completely content being weaned by my Lord, my God, yep. who is my sustenance. Exactly. Because guess what? I've never known a baby. But Ray, maybe you've delivered a baby. 
<laughs> that came out and said, Mom, here's the shopping list when you go to the grocery store. Make sure you get uh, baby formula. Make sure you get uh, baby food. You know what I'm saying? I'm guessing never had one, right? Never had one. That baby is totally dependent on, on the parent. And this is where, this is what real worship does, is it says, look, okay, I'm not God. That's right. When we walk through the doors, we're saying, not my department. Exactly. I'm not God, and I'm turning this over to God. And, and I think that's something, friends, we, we, we all gr wrestle with because we spend six days of our lives trying to control yeah. things, manipulate things so they'll be in our favor, which isn't wrong, but it can change, it can play with our minds. Yeah. You could see the two completely polar opposites in that in that chapter. Yep. One where I'm audi, I think of myself. I only I do things on my own. I'm lofty. Usually, loftiness creates where you have exactly. a, a believe in your own accomplishments. That you're the sole one that has get, got you to the success you are. While the other one says, I am totally dependent on my mother as a yep. child, which means I'm totally dependent on my Lord for my exactly. sustenance and for my success. Yep. And so that's the thing. We, we, you know, we look at the Sabbath as a day of rest, but there's a profound message here. Yeah. In an agricultural society, and again, Ray will understand this because of his first love or second love. I don't know if it's, I think it's maybe farming, but, but um, you know, to use the expression, time is money. And, you know, you, you know, when it's harvesting time, planting time, you know, many farmers are out there seven days a week. You know, with yeah. their quarter million dollar, you know, high tech, uh, you know, combine and so forth. And, and, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, why would we say, okay, God says, I know you're an agricultural society. Roger Prather brought this out last night and we, in a youth meeting, you know, to stop and not work on the seventh day. Mm to provide for your family, to advance, you know, your economic status, that, that just, that seems bizarre. It brings us another thing in my mind, too, is our reliance on our technology and our creations, manly yep. creations, as our source of everything we have and do. Yep. We, we have a tendency to focus on science, and science is the ultimate rule right. of everything, right. when in fact God is, is, supersedes that. Right. And there are things that we don't understand. There are things that we can't grasp, right. that he can only grasp. So we all get caught up into this thing of our reliance on other things except for our Lord as who created those things, who gave them the mind to who create the these mind. things. Exactly. You see? Exactly. So, so I do not. So here's the point. He says, I don't concern myself with great matters. Yep, yep. Or things too wonderful for me. I don't let my mind go there because I don't have the bandwidth to figure it exactly. out. Exactly. And then he says, I'm like a calm and quieted child. I'm a weaned child. Right. And, and that imagery is so powerful. So let's go to Psalm 126. Yep. And um, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, we, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves with them. Yep. So, why did the author have us look at Psalm 126? <laughs> what is this about? It's a more challenging one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is a little bit more challenging. It is more yep. challenging. Yep. But when you look at it, you know, I think the, we, we can resonate with the latter part. Those who sow with tears will receive song, uh, receive, uh, reap songs of joy, go up weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying the sheaves with them. How does this relate to worship, Doug? How well, does this worship relate? It almost feels like experiential again. 
Yeah. Because you can't have joy without experience. You have, in order to expre express that emotion, you have to have had an experience you to express that to joy. You have experience. And so. also uh, 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 emotions of sorrow, captivity. Yep. yep. Uh, and our tongue would sing it. So in other words, it's all about praises to the Lord for what he has done. Yep. Uh, even bringing them through hard times as well. When you look at captivity. Yep. yep. So, the, and what strikes me is pretty, uh, I'm just, you know, it's leaping off the page. These are all heavy emotions. Yes, they are. Yep. Tears, weeping, and then later on, songs of joy. At, at verse 5, those who sow in tears yep. shall reap in joy. Yep. Now, let me ask a question. <laughs> How emotional. Here we are in the heart of New England, guys. How emotional do oh we boy. get? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10, being 10 being very emotional, 1 being non-emotional, are we a minus 1? <laughs> Maybe a 1 or a 2? What would you say? Anybody, would anybody put us at a 10? Very emotional. You? Oh, you personally. Okay. But what about us as a group? Anybody put us at a five? Hmm. New England culture. New England culture is a tough is one, one of restraining emotion rather yeah. than displaying it. Mark Twain, and I wish I'd found that quote. He had a really interesting quote about New Englanders and and about you know how they were, you know, we were totally unresponsive. He had a reading or something, and and nobody responded, and he made some quip about New Englanders, but. But what is, this is, goes back to culture, culture, and, oh, okay, and the, at, at the end of the day, culture is so defining. So, yeah. Doug, will you mind, I think it might be an emergency here. Okay, all right. Okay, so anyhow, um, yeah, what do you think of what the pastor's saying? Can we be too emotional or too non-emotional in our thinking? I know having grown up in a French culture, uh, emotion's it. We express a lot of emotion. But when I was grown up, growing up in the uh, New England culture, showing emotion was not a facet of what you ought to do. So, in terms of worship, you notice that in Psalm 126, we're dealing with of high emotion, joy, tears. Those are expressions of emotion. Or should we, I guess the question I would ask is, do, should we have a fine balance in all of that? There's, a, there's such a thing as emotional IQ, intelligence IQ, IQ and EIQ? E they both are existent. They both have to be. But to what level? Yeah, I guess it depends on how your emotion is expressed and for what reason, right? Like so if, you, that, if you get angry because someone says, I don't like your tie, that's really low emotional IQ. But if you're emotional because your first child is born, or because you watch your daughter sing in front of people for the first time in her life, or because you love Jesus, I think absolutely nothing wrong with any of those. I think worshiping God can only but be stirring of emotion. You have to come out of emotion, right? Uh, yeah. Because all these terms that we use, gratitude, honest, respect, thank, uh, being a thankful heart, has to stir emotion. I, I, it, there's no other way around it. And is God an emotional God? Of course he is. I mean, I was raised a little like you, like in a John Wayne society, you know, and men never showed emotion. Yeah, exactly. They took yep. the brunt of everything. Yep. They, yep. But you can't help but get emotional at some circumstances. Particularly on the issue of crying, tears, for men. That wasn't a thing. Yeah. Men don't cry. You hear that? You heard that many times. I've heard that when I was a kid. Don't cry. Men don't cry. Real men. Tough. <laughs> That's what I used to hear. Real men don't cry. 
But what it does, does is it, it keeps your emotions within yourself and you can't be expressive anymore. And that creates penned up. Creates distance. Yeah, I, I personally think it does. Yeah. And if we have a distance amongst each other, imagine what type of distance we have with our Lord. If we can't do it amongst each other, we're talking about emotional emotions oh, versus, because yeah. I was talking about IQ, you got intelligence IQ, you got emotional IQ. Yeah. Both have to exist. Yep. Because all the traits that are being mentioned here are emotions. Yeah. I mean, Jesus even tells us, you know, interrupt worship. If you have a bone to pick with a brother or sister in Christ, brother or sister, what does he say? Leave your offering and go and reconcile and then come back. So there's something about that, like you're, you're saying, yeah, exactly. So Where, uh, Worship without emotion is, uh, I can't see it happening. No, no, absolutely. I cannot. <laughs> and just because we're more, you know, I don't want to, you know, rain on our, you know, our, what was the word I'm trying to, restricted, uh, our, our um, somebody called me stiff, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's terms that he used, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we're not worshiping the Lord. But I'm saying is, that, but there is a point there where, you know, I mean, let's, let's be like this, if, if uh, Marge, you're never going to sit there the rest of your life. So let's say I'm picking, let's say, I, hey, good morning, Marge. <laughs> and she responds with a deadpan face. Just like that. Good, good, good. I would say, oh, no, what's going on? It's like everything, it, you know, everything okay in your life? Is everything okay with us? You know what I'm saying? You know, what's going on? Did you have a bad week? So you read each other's expressions and and uh, I won't pick on you only 10 more I won't pick on you within 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> so um, but yeah that's 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 important um, and I say you know we we kind of miss out on the holistic aspect of living because we can compartmentalize our lives pretty well and we say well I really have a bone to pick with, I'm making this up, Mr. Smith over there in the other corner. So I'm just going to be over here, he'll be over there, and the twain shall never meet. <laughs> well, God has a sense of humor. And, you know, he's going to make it so that you, that you meet, even if it's in the kingdom. Yeah. By the grace yeah. of God, you both, we both, we all, everybody gets there. But Jesus says, and I, this is not about forgiveness, but this is so intertwined. They it's are. the Lord's prayer. Yep. Forgive us our debts, right? And as we, and so there's this interconnectedness. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we have, it's frightening how we can compartmentalize our lives. And, it, and, 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 and this is why upbringing is so important, because if you are told to refrain your emotion, to refrain the way that you feel yeah your relationship with the lord is fractured oh absolutely it's fractured yeah. because you I, i've seen that myself a lot of times i start praying and i can't i can't pull out that emotion yeah i can't take it out yeah partly because of the way i was trained and taught so do you and think that doesn't necessarily mean people telling me that it just was the un non-verbal communication told you that so is it okay to it's worship so Okay, this mess on Herak. Is it okay to yell to God? I. Uh, that's a good question. Well, there's there's examples of people crying to God. Yeah. In the Bible, yeah. and I don't think he meant tearful. I might think he meant like screaming with passion and. Yeah. I think that's the crying that I. That's the way I interpret it. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I yeah. would say if we're like, oh boy. I'm going to talk to God now. I better contain, control myself. Do you know the <laughs> irony is? He knows we're saying that. So he's knowing that we're not even coming to him as we really are. Right. Genuineness. <laughs> is we, the, yeah, yeah it's, genuineness. It's crucial because he's like, if you're upset, show your upsetness. Exactly. The Lord would prefer that you be honest and true to yourself. Yeah. And which goes back to Psalm 15 now, which is talking about the, the types of things we ought to bring when we, ought, when we come to worship. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So let's, let's do that one because that's a very good, good one. Um, I'll read that if I get to it quick enough here. But I think that's where, you know, um, 
we, we, that's why it's important for us to be together because we need to feel each other's pulses. Right. You know, read each other's, our vibes and, and uh, um, you know, how are you doing and how are you really doing? Coming so apart that's a good thing. Here. I got a brand new one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so a Psalm of David. Now look, now remember David. Let's pick on David. He's not here to defend himself. <laughs> <laughs> the guy, what happens? He's bringing the, the, the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He's so happy. What is he doing? Dancing. Dancing, yeah. Dancing. Wow. Now, look, we're here 2024. We're sitting in a conservative New England area. But, you know, if somebody came dancing down the aisle like David did, would we, <laughs> <laughs> would we say, let's just go with it? Or say, let's give them, let's give them that look, you know? And so that's where it's, it's, but that's the problem. And if I do that, then I'm more like, remember her name, Michael? Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of dynamic, I'm sure baggage in, behind that, that judgment she made. But, yeah. but still, nonetheless, she kind of said, are you, you're making a fool of yourself. <laughs> and, and he yeah. was so ecstatic that this beautiful moment was happening, that he had to dance before the Lord. And so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's it, and David, you know, he, why, why was David a man after God's own heart? I think he was true to himself. He wasn't yep. uh, making himself be somebody that he was not. Right. Aside from that one time that he got off track there. But, yeah, I think it's, it's being truthful and, and being uh, humble. And I yeah. think he lived from his heart. Yep. And he was actually after pursuing after God's heart. God's, God's will, yeah. He wasn't pursuing an image, wasn't pursuing God's greatness. He was pursuing the heart of God. Yeah. And that's, that takes us to a different yeah. Let's level. read this because it, yeah. it, it brings a lot of good things here. I'll read it. Lord, who may abide in your mm. uh, t tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy, ho holy hill, he walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does not take up a reproach, a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt, I got H-U-R-T here, I'm not sure if they made a misspelling in my Bible or not here. And does not change. He who does not put out his money as usury, mm -hmm. nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Mm. He who does these things shall never be moved. Amen. But here's the problem. You read verse 2, Doug. Yep. Who may dwell in, the sac in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless. Yep. Well, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> that raises a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm disqualified. I mean, um, you know, and, and uh, did I always do what was righteous? Did, uh, you know, did I always speak the truth from the heart? Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm not here to go through my list of, of, mis of sins, but blameless is a big word. You know what I'm saying? And, and does no wrong. I can't think of anything I did wrong to my neighbor. You know what I'm saying? But it's but this level. So what's going on here, my friends? What is that? And, and who's writing this? David. David was was David perfect? He's not. So what's going on here? Well, if, you, if there's a verse a little later on that says in spirit and in truth, right? Yep. And the book and the and the and the lesson says, who's the spirit? Jesus mm. Christ. Mm -hmm. So if we live in the spirit, yeah. which is Jesus, he, if we're in that spirit, that is, yep. he's going to make us blameless in right. front of the Lord. Right. I think that's the, yeah, that's the answer right there. It doesn't mean we're perfect every day. Right. 
but he's willing, he's going to cover, and he's going to help us to recognize, and there's going to be a progression. Yep. I don't think it's going to be perfection, but a progression towards yep. that. And I think that's, you know, we got to remember, we're looking at this from a New Testament right, perspective. Right. David doesn't know what we know. No. He doesn't have the blessings we have. And so we understand this powerful imagery with the robe of righteousness and, 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 and uh, you know, Jesus over and over again, you know, tells the story about the party and one man's there without the robe. And, and how do we actually go into the presence of God? We all say we're a sinner. Right. And miraculously, that thief on the cross gets to hear Jesus say, you'll be with me in paradise. The only person, as far as I know, in all of 66 books of the Bible, he looks him in the eye. Well, I don't know if he would look at him, but he's, he actually hears Jesus say, you're going to be with me in paradise. With yeah. a crook. And, and so, um, you know, in that moment, that robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ gets wrapped around that man. If you look at the sanctuary relating to what the Old Testament saw it and how the sanctuary was, was built, there was a process. Yep. And the priest was to enter the most holy, which our high priest is Jesus. Yep. So he's the one that's the only one that could mediate to the Father on our behalf. Yep. Because we can't reach the Father directly. Right. Because of our sin. Right. And so that whole sanctuary process was built in that consequence. The burnt, the animal, the sacrifice. Yep. Then the priest would take the blood. Bring it to the whole most holy place where the sins were forgiven. Yep. Um, which we know that's a representation of Jesus. But, yep. but today, you're right. I mean, uh, what you just said is, is exactly on, is that without God, those sins and iniquities are not forgiven. Yep. <laughs> and so, uh, he's, so our, here, he's our righteous. Here's where, well, we got two minutes, so I can't open oh, up a can of worms. <laughs> yeah, I can't give, I'm going to open up a can of worms We didn't get it all here. done, but we, we so, got close. Anyway. But, um, uh, you know... I think, you know, coming back to worship, it's coming to God as we really are. Amen. And, and Psalm 92, just touching that in our, in our two okay, minutes we got 92 here. Okay, here. So, did anybody have any questions about what we talked about today? Anybody? Input? So, you know, I think it's important to realize that worship changes with time. And, and uh, you know, as my, I remember years and years and years and years ago, I had sort of an epiphany uh, that, wow, you know, we have our worship service, which, which works. Yeah. But what did, what did they, how do they worship at the time of Jesus? You know, they, I, I know one thing, there wasn't, and I love, or, I love organ, there wasn't an organ, right? <laughs> there wasn't the piano. It wasn't a nice climate control baptistry and a Paul, you know what I'm saying? It was very different. Yeah. And so we have become enculturated with what we have here, which works. Yeah. It's a good system. Yeah. And yeah. and but no system is perfect. So so that's where it kind of is the rub, but um, you know, when we're in heaven, when we are in the presence of God for the very first time, my friends, I don't think there is any way we could ever come close to replicating on earth what we will have there. That scene that says, what a day that will be? Yeah. 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 There's no way. I mean, yeah. I'm sure we've all heard glorious music over the years, here and other places, yeah. and, and, and choirs, Mormon Tabernacle Choir, whatever it might be, you know, just exquisite. It isn't going to compare. Perfection. Perfection, Everything yeah. done out of perfection. Yep. It's, it's hard for us as human beings to even fathom that yep. kind of... Yep. Is, even the best of music, there's still imperfection in it somehow. Oh, we yeah. just don't pick it up, yeah. but it is. But the thing is, too, so when you look at some of these um, incredible choirs, you know, they, too... There could be one choir member there just, maybe they're an atheist. Yeah. And they're just there because it's a job. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they're just, they're just say, so, so they're just okay. doing, going through the motions. So how does God, going back to where we started, 
how does God honor worship? You know, and I think that's part of what we're dealing with here to, this morning. But we have run out of time. Yeah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the fact, the, the true fact that you are seeking to connect with us. Oh, Lord, may we reciprocate. May we truly behold your invitation. And may we indeed come to you heart to heart, mind to mind, and may we indeed connect with you at all times, Lord, whether it be here in the sanctuary or whether it be when we're at the grocery store or, or, or uh, taking a walk. Hmm. May we sense that and may we realize that we, are, we worship you as a community, as a community that we are interdependent, that we need one another. Thank you for this lesson. May we, you be with us as we seek to really put it into practice each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.